so this, uh, this Advent season, I think, is, is really just a, a great opportunity uh, to think what a, what a privilege to be able to focus for a time and, and actually be told to do this. Would you take a season and would you think about the coming of Jesus? Would you celebrate all that Jesus means to this world, to our lives? Uh, w- would you also take the time to consider the great hope that we have in him because just as surely as his first coming his first advent was promised so is his second advent where he promises when he comes again that he will actually bring what he calls the renewal of all things you think about the gift we've been given and the hope that we have uh, in Christ it's an amazing thing and and here's here's what I get to do this is talk about a great blessing Um, I get to direct you during this time to the love of God because here's what I believe. I believe that during this Advent, what God really wants is for us to have an experience and a realization of the magnitude of his love for us. And not only for us to experience it, but also for us to share and, and to be a conduit for others to experience the magnitude of the love of God for people. And, and here's, here's the thing that I think is so important to understand about the love of God for you for you specifically and personally. Um, okay, so it wasn't that God saw you and you were, you were a little bitty baby and God looked at you and said, oh my goodness, this is a cute one. I think, I think I'm going to love this one, right? I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my love on this one. That's not how it happened. And God didn't look at you as you were growing up and, and you, were, you were a young person and, and, and he didn't look at you and say, you know, this one's really getting it right. This is really impressive. This is impressive stuff. This one's got real potential. So I'm, I'm going to set my love on this young man. I'm going to set my love on this young woman. That's not how it happened either. And it wasn't that God saw as you were, let's, let's call it um, maturing, um, <laughs> as you were maturing. It wasn't that God said, you know what? This woman, this man has been serving me so faithfully for so many years. I think, I think I'm going to set my love on this person. Wasn't that either. But in fact, and God says this through the prophet Jeremiah. God says, can you imagine God saying such a thing? God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God's love for you is ancient. God's love for you It's from before creation. Before creation, God knew you. Before creation, God loved you. And for proof, for evidence of that, what I'd like to offer you is the plan of salvation which was set into place before creation itself. This is uh, is the Apostle Peter. And certainly this comes from Jesus' own instruction to the Apostle Peter as he now passes it on to us. This is what he says. God chose him, that is Jesus, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. And so in God's foreknowledge, he knew that we would take the gift of free will that he would give to us so that we could choose to truly love him. He knew that we would take that precious gift and we would spend it on rebellion that we would turn from him. He knew that we would do that. And he also knew that once we had broken that relationship, we would not be able to restore it. We would not be able to make it right. We would not be able to heal what was broken. He knew all of that in his foreknowledge. And in his love, he determined, even before creation, that he would come and he would come to save us. And he would save us by giving himself to us in Jesus Christ. And and, and so, as I share what I, I think of as the theme passage of this, this whole series, this Advent sermon series that, that we just simply called, For You, what I want to invite you to do is I read from this. This is from 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to invite you to listen for those words, For You. Listen for those words and, and consider the significance of what it means that this gift of salvation was planned for you. It says, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterward. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. 
And now, this good news has been announced to you by those who preach in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. And so what we see is that the prophets of the Old Testament, the way I think of this, is that the prophets of the Old Testament, God uses them to speak His ancient love down through the centuries and to us in the present day. God gives the, these Old Testament prophets, these, these prophets of God, He gives them insight about the coming of Jesus. And sometimes we see it, it's, um, it's sort of a hint, uh, it, it's an illusion. But then there are these other places that we see in the Old Testament prophets where God speaks with such clarity. He speaks a specific promise about the coming of Jesus. And what we see is that lots of times what God does is He actually uses the situation, the, the circumstance of the prophet to illustrate, to help us to understand who Jesus would be and why He would come and, and what He would do. And so what we've been doing now is looking into these prophecies about the coming of Jesus and specifically what I want what I want to ask you as we read from now Malachi is to consider the fact that this ancient plan of salvation this plan that was set before the creation of the world that it was for you it was for you Malachi, uh, what we're going to do is read uh, some verses from chapter 3 and 4. We're going to lift kind of out of that immediate context. We're going to lift these out so that we can see where Jesus is foretold. Look, we read, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly is surely coming. The Lord of heaven's army says, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace, and on that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives, his preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. I want to ask you, if you would, uh, if, if you all would pray for me and I'll pray for you, we'll pray for one another as we dig into God's word here. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you that you love us so much that you would reveal yourself to us in your word, that you would reveal our Savior to us in your word, and God, that you would reveal to us through him the way of life. Lord, speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts. Change us. Make us new. And make us free in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So God speaks through the prophets this, this gracious salvation prepared for you. And, and, and like I said, I'm so hoping that God would give you an experience and a realization that his love is specifically for you. But now we're going we're gonna to kind of zoom in on one particular aspect, a central aspect of this salvation that was promised, and that is God's desire to make us free. That, that's a central as a central place in the salvation of Jesus, that he wants us to be free. He wants us to have this, uh, this joyful freedom. I love this image. <laughs> Listen to this. Uh, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. And I just think that's great, right? And so what we're seeing here in the scriptures is important to kind of get the characters right. We're seeing two messengers here. First messenger is John the Baptist that Luke tells us is a fulfillment of this prophecy of Malachi. That he's the one who comes to prepare the way of the Lord. So he is the messenger of this mentioned first. Then it's promised that the Lord that they're anticipating, eagerly waiting for, would come, and he would be the messenger of the covenant. That messenger, therefore, is Jesus. So John prepares the way. Now the messenger of the covenant comes. He comes and brings the new covenant. And it would be a covenant that would bring us a relationship that would bring us to freedom. A lot like what Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 36. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And in 1511, he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And I just want us to take a moment right now. I know we're, listen, we're very quiet people, right? We, we Methodists, we're very subdued. We're, we're very, very quiet. 
you know, cautious. We, you know, I, I can tell you're saying amen just in your eyes. I mean, you, you really, you communicate that so well through your eyes and, and your body language. And, and so, but I thought it'd be really, it'd be so appropriate at this very point to see that there is a God in the universe and that he has benevolent desires for our lives that he actually wants freedom and joy. This, like a calf gone free, free indeed, free in joy kind of freedom. And just consider then that that is the desire of the God of the universe, and it seems to me that this would be a great moment for us to just say out loud, all together, praise God, right? Praise God. Yeah, amen. well done. Yeah, see, and nobody got hurt. It was, it was fine. Nothing bad happened. You can even say hallelujah every once in a while. Amen. Yeah, it's, it's all good. It's, but, I mean, consider that. That is his desire. And so what I want to say as we're digging into this scripture is let's not settle. Let's not settle for the false version of freedom that the world offers us. The version of freedom that the world offers us is, is really about the fulfillment of every passion and desire of the flesh. Whatever you feel like doing, you do it. That's the definition of freedom. But the thing is about that version of freedom is that it actually doesn't take us to freedom, but it actually puts us in greater and greater bondage. That we actually make ourselves greater and greater captive to the desires of our flesh in bondage actually more and more to sin. It's a little bit like this. Um, my, my nephews uh, who live in Plant City, it's where I, I grew up, and, and they're, they're there. They have for the last few years raised steers. So FFA, take them to the Strawberry Festival, um, you know, they show them, somebody pays way too much for them, and then they become hamburger and it's, everybody's happy, right? Oh, except the cow, but, or the steer, but everybody else. Um, so they, when they first get these steers, they're, they're calves, right? And the thing about it is almost always these calves do not want to be in the fenced in area, in the pen that they have built for them in the back of their property, right? They just don't want to be there. And so they're pushing, they're trying to get out, they're having to put up electric wire and all this stuff. Well, there's one of those steers that actually managed to jump over the fence, right? He had, he had a great vertical leap. He, he made it right over the fence. Problem is that the neighbor behind them also has a fence. <laughs> and there is about this much space between one fence and the other. So I'm thinking about his mindset as he launches himself, he thinks, finally, I've made it, right? I'm going to clear this fence, and I'm going to be free only to find himself absolutely planted and pinned. He's like, like this in between the fences, and that's the, kind of, that's the kind of freedom that the world offers us. Because if we're going to be free, if we're really going to be free, then our souls will have to be set free. The chains that bind our souls will have to be broken, and it is Jesus who does that. And so today, what, what I want us to look at is how he actually does that. What does that look like? How does Jesus bring us to freedom? And the first thing that we're going we're to look into the scriptures about is that part of how Jesus brings us to freedom is, is by the covenant that he brings. The covenant that he brings. Um, covenant is, is just, it's not a word we use a lot, but it's simply a, a, a word that means a committed relationship. The closest, I, I think, sort of um, illustration would be uh, of marriage. Marriage is a, is a covenant relationship. It, it's a committed relationship. And so the prophet Jeremiah receives this word from God and he passes it on. He, he says through Jeremiah that, that this new covenant is coming, this new committed relationship, this new relationship that has a new basis to it. In fact, Jeremiah, the prophet, reports for God that this new covenant, this new relationship will be entered through the forgiveness of sins. That God will wipe away our sins so that we can be a part of this new committed relationship. And therefore, it will be a covenant of grace. A covenant that is based upon the forgiveness of God, a gift of forgiveness from Him to us so that we can be in this relationship. This is why the Scripture says um, that this messenger of the covenant whom you look for so eagerly. In the day of Malachi, there was this great eagerness for the coming of this, this new covenant. God, you've promised that it's coming. And when is it coming? When? Lord, we so want this covenant because here's the thing about the old covenant. The old covenant was based upon the law. 
And therefore, it was about people's performance of the law. If we could do it, if we could obey all of the law, then we could, we could earn this relationship. We could stay in it because we've been obedient and we've fulfilled the law. The problem is, because of our brokenness, we could not, and the law in the end ends up showing us how broken we are. The law ends up showing us in the end how desperately we need God. We need grace. It points us to our need. And so we see that we are set free in this new covenant, this covenant that would be a covenant of grace. You know, it's interesting. The, uh, the, the last words in Malachi, we're actually reading the very last words of the Old Testament. Chapter 4, Malachi is it, and we're done with the Old Testament. And so the last words of the Old Testament are about God striking the earth with a curse, striking the land with a curse. There's a word of judgment, a word of judgment that comes because of our sin. So that's the last word of the Old Testament. But check this out. The last word of the New Testament, of the New Covenant, is a word of grace. This is, this is the very last line of the Scriptures. Revelation 22, 21. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. Now, is that a coincidence that the last words of the old covenant are a word of curse and the word of the new covenant, the covenant of grace, is a word of grace? I don't really think that's a coincidence. I don't really think that's a coincidence. The covenant that Jesus brings to us is a covenant of grace that we enter by His forgiveness, His grace, and not something that we do. We have this freedom in Jesus and it is an eternal freedom. You know, Ro Romans chapter 8 and verse 2 says this, And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son. And you will go free. Free from sin, that is from the power of sin over our lives, free from the guilt of sin, free from the punishment of sin, free from the shame of sin, free from fear, free from death, and you will be free. And Jesus says, when the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, second thing, and this is really connected to the first, obviously, is that Christ sets us free because of who He is, because of who the messenger is. This messenger of the covenant, who it is, really, really matters. And that is that this messenger of the covenant is the Lord Himself. It is God. When God chooses to offer this covenant of grace, He comes Himself. When he, when he determines that it is the time of salvation to offer this salvation for this new covenant to be enacted, He comes and offers it. He doesn't send an emissary. He doesn't send a representative. He comes Himself. And after all, isn't that what you would do if you're offering a committed relationship of love? Isn't that what you do? So, I'm thinking about this. Okay, so what if, what if, just imagine this. What if when I wanted to ask Ashley to marry me, I had sent someone else? Just imagine that scenario. Like picture that in your head. Like my emissary shows up and says, Ashley, uh, Jeremy has something that he would like to ask you. Um, I'm thinking maybe it would have been a different answer. I'm just saying. Like, maybe, maybe a different answer. You know, one of, the, one of the movements in our culture is toward what we could call a, a religious syncretism. And, and what that means is this, this sort of movement and, and belief and thought process that, that really all religions are the same. And, and that really uh, the image of this, the image that, that of this, maybe you've even heard this, is that we're all kind of climbing a mountain, right? And, and the image is that God's at the top, and we're all climbing the mountain. We're climbing the mountain in different places, uh, but we're all going to the same place, right? And so all religions are, are just the same. And that's, that's really, that's a thing in our culture right now. And, and what's real important to know about that is that it's, well, it's wrong. Um, <laughs> and, and the reason it's wrong, and there are lots of reasons, but the primary reason that it's wrong is this. That this image, that we're all climbing this mountain to get to God, is all about our effort to get to God. It is all about what we're doing to get to God. And that is not just different than the Christian faith. That is literally the opposite of the Christian faith. 
The Christian faith is not about what we do to get to God. The Christian faith is about what God has done to get to us. What He has done to come to us and save us. God has come Himself in Jesus. If there is a mountain, He has come down it. And He has met us where we are. And that sets us free. And I want to tell you why. Because, because it frees us from the tyranny of the climb. It frees us from the tyranny of the, cr- of the climb. Well, the crime too, but, but the climb, right? This thing where we think, you know, I, I've got to keep doing. I've got to keep striving. I've got, to, I've got to prove my worth. I've got to justify my existence. I've got to prove myself to God. I've got to clean my life up so I'm worthy of God. I've got to be a good person so that God will receive me. There is such a tyranny in that. And this, this Jesus who comes to us, He offers us Himself. You know, I had this terrifying thought this week. Literally terrifying. This is a terrifying image. It was a Becky and me singing a duet. And uh, no, I'm just I'm playing. It was a solo. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so no, I had this this really terrifying thought, and, and and the thought was of the return of Jesus, when He will come and bring the renewal of all things and judge the living and the dead. And I had this I had this thought, this image of Jesus coming, and I'm looking at Him, and I don't know Him. He's a stranger to me. And I thought about how terrifying it would be to not know the judge at that moment. And how terrifying it would be to not know the king at his coming. And I think that the Lord allowed me to have that that sort of terrible thought so that he could give me this next thought. (laughs) But I do know him. But I do know him. I have known the sun of righteousness dawning upon my heart. I have, I have felt His love. I've, I've known what it is to have Christ dwelling in my heart by faith. But I have known Him. And what a freedom to know that, that we know the King and we are safe in His possession forever. I don't know of another freedom like that. I just don't we are made free because of who the messenger is and finally the last point now Christ makes us free because of the healing that he brings in our hearts you know um, when I first started reading the scriptures this is literally this is this is the first time that I ever experienced the power of the Word of God and what I mean by that is reading the Word of God and having God enact the truth of his word at that very moment to feel the touch of God at that very moment. This is the first time that ever happened to me. It was in the book of the prophet Ezekiel. And, and in, in, his, in his book, he talks about the need for the healing of our hearts. This is what he says. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I... I literally felt God softening my heart even as I was reading those words. The truth is that we have hard hearts. And they're hard for different reasons. For for some, it's anger and and it's bitterness. For some, it's it's like a a selfishness and and a pride. For for some, it's a resistance and a rebellion against God. But our hearts are hard and we, and we build up these walls around us. And until God actually shows us, we don't even know that we are building walls that are a prison for ourselves. When our hearts are hard, I think about how it holds our relationships captive. I mean, when our hearts are hard, think about a, what a relationship is like. We can't really love people. We can't really serve people because it's got to be about us, about protecting ourselves and, and questioning the value of this person for me. How does this person fulfill my needs? What can this person do for me? Are you fulfilling my expectations? Are you meeting my needs? We can't really love with a hard heart. And I think about our relationship with God and what that's like to harden our heart toward God. It is to have to resist the God who made us. It takes so much energy 
to keep those walls up because here's the thing we can keep building these walls up around our hearts to keep God out but he's pulling down the back side of the wall while we're building over here and we go back and repair that and God is trying to break through that wall to get to our hearts and all the while we have to deny the utter starvation of our souls apart from God it is a prison to have a hard heart and it's really interesting to me how God heals a hard heart and it almost seems cruel at first but it is the way to healing the way God heals a hard heart is that he breaks it he breaks it now John the Baptist is is foretold here and John's message his preaching was really very simple it was repent repent of your sin he brought the conviction of sin upon people's lives the conviction that they needed God but such a beautiful thing happened listen to this his preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers can you imagine a more beautiful thing than this but it is through repentance and it is through a broken heart John announces the king is coming he's already on the field it's time to start living a different way life is on the way it's time to repent and here's the thing that happens God convicts us he makes us afraid but but God is so good at the very moment he makes us afraid he also makes us understand his love for us the conviction and the love come together listen to this but for you who fear my name the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings conviction and love at the same moment fear and the release of fear in his perfect love at the same moment you may remember a, a hymn that's sort of famous uh, it's called amazing grace and there's this line in that hymn that is so beautiful and true and biblical twas grace you remember this twas grace that taught my heart you remember to fear but it doesn't stop there <laughs> that's right and grace my fears relieved he breaks our hearts of stone so that he can give us a heart of flesh so here's the thing today I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to set our hearts at liberty wants to set our souls free and I believe that he's offering that and and so it comes down to this how is it that the Lord is speaking into your heart right now to bring you to freedom it could be that you you are being asked to believe the covenant of grace that you can stop striving that you can just rest in the grace of Jesus Christ because he's done all the work he's done all of it or it could be that what you really need is a touch from the Lord himself you need him to touch your heart with his love to tell you that he loves you he loves you specifically or it could be that your heart has begun to harden and what really needs to happen today is a breaking of your heart so that it can be healed whatever it is I plead with you to allow the Lord to do his work in your life and let's lift one another up as we as we seek after this freedom that Jesus offered us which would you pray with me oh Lord we thank you we thank you for the covenant of grace we thank that you thank you that you came and you came personally to offer that covenant of grace in your great love and we thank you that it is your intention to bring us to full salvation to full freedom to heal us in that way and so Lord we yield to you we say to you Lord we are yours and yours forever do your work Lord to make us free and we will give you all the praise and glory and honor as we pray this in Jesus' name. And together we say, Amen.